The SEC football season is winding down with just three three weeks left of regular season play. The college football playoff race is heating up, helping us talk all things SEC football. Caroline Fenton of Yahoo Sports and Sirius XM does a fantastic job breaking down not just the SEC, but college football as a whole as well. Caroline, appreciate you taking the time. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, absolutely. I've loved following along all of your content, everything you put on on social media. So excited to be here in probably like I know I'll take a, you know, a page out of the Bachelorette's playbook, like the most exciting season yet. But like that's <laughs> that's literally what this season has felt like. Yeah, Caroline, funny enough, I, I didn't mention this where we got going. So it's funny how things work out in the whole media world yeah. or just life in general. The way that I discovered you was over this summer when our friends over at Texas Sports Unfiltered had the mishap and they thought they got oh, no. they thought they got a certain guest and it ended up being you. And they're like, all right, well, we're just gonna run with it. So that was actually my introduction to Caroline Fenton. I was like, it's just funny how things work out. I had to bring that up. For those that don't know, again, we go on their show daily. We do the SEC Unfiltered Hour. And uh that was a pretty we were there media days with them doing our segment. It was it was kind of funny how that worked out. Uh you never know who you're going to run into. So. This world is so tiny and the media industry is so tiny. And then whenever you even make it smaller, like the SEC, SEC football media industry is so small. Everybody knows someone who knows someone. So it was, you know, I I know that the Texas Sports Unfiltered guys felt like so embarrassed over that <laughs> encounter, but we made some friends out of it. So, so there you go. It was all good. It was exactly. Was no you you never know what connections or friendships you're going to make, right? Exactly. This, Even if it's someone that you mistook, it's okay. <laughs> it's just a new friend, new indeed. opportunities. Yeah, indeed. Well, Caroline, you're a noted LSU fan, LSU mm -hmm. alum. Let's just start there because, again, I want to get into playoff and the rankings and kind of what we've got left in this 2024 SEC football season and college football season as a whole. But LSU took a tough L over the weekend. I, I was probably one of the biggest swings and misses of my career. I don't know if it was my trip to Baton Rouge a month or so ago. I was intoxicated by the Death Valley at night storyline going in. But uh, Alabama just flexes their muscles yet again and, and let us reminded us of who they are. Uh, your thoughts, though, on LSU? There's been a lot of chatter, obviously, around you know, Brian Kelly, and mm -hmm. there's just a lot of pressure with that job. It's a pressure cooker. Year three, judge me on year three is what PK said. You look at the last three coaches, they won national championships. Pretty sure they were all in year three, if I do recall, or at least that was their jumping point. Your overall assessment of the LSU football program right now. And what's crazy, Caroline, they're mm -hmm. not dead yet. You'd think they are, but because that first loss was non-conference, there is still a path somehow some way for LSU to make the SEC title game but in in your mind again you do this for a living you're yeah. kind of unbiased just viewpoint of this LSU program right now yeah it's there's still a path to get to Atlanta and then you win the SEC championship game now all of a sudden you know you're just resurrected and you end up with a first round bye in the playoffs that's not going to happen. Like it, it, it's, I know that crazy things have happened this season. I know that things that feel so far fetched are totally feasible in this sport. I, I, I don't see the path. Like it would be a lot of things would have to go right for LSU and wrong for several other contenders. I just can't predict that happening in terms of this, this LSU program. It's incredibly disappointing to see how this program's just kind of been a flat line since Brian Kelly has gotten here. And that's not to say that Brian Kelly hasn't achieved like some massive milestones through two and a half, almost three seasons. You know, you beat Nick Saban in Alabama in year one. You get to the SEC championship game in year one. You have a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback in year two. You've kind of established that LSU is a place to come for quarterback development now that you've had two quarterbacks over the last three quarterback cycles that have won Heisman trophies, both Joe Burrow and Jaden Daniels in year two. So, and Brian Kelly is recruiting at an incredibly high level. Bryce Underwood, the number one player and quarterback in the 2025 class, is committed to LSU. DeCorian Moore was committed to LSU, now committed to Oregon, the number one wide receiver in the country, and is still opening his recruitment up to LSU. He was in Baton Rouge on Saturday night. So he's recruiting at an incredibly high level, both nationally and in the state of Louisiana. And if you know anything about the LSU football program, if you can lock down the state of Louisiana and keep 70 to 75% of the top talent at home, like you're going to be mm -hmm. in, in pretty good shape because some of the best talent in the country is located and centralized in South Louisiana and Baton Rouge and Lafayette and New Orleans. Brian Kelly has done a really great job with that. 
I think Auburn fans would tell you recruiting is really great. <laughs> Winning is what matters. And although nine and three is not really much to scoff at, I think there are a lot of programs in college football in the SEC that would do anything for a nine and three season. It's not good enough at LSU. Going to the SEC championship game and beating Alabama in year one is not good enough if you can't follow that up with more wins against top five, top 10 teams, with more wins against Alabama. There are such high expectations at this job. Brian Kelly knew that, and that's the reason why Brian Kelly came to LSU is because it is a pressure cooker, is because there are such high expectations. And you also get rewarded with really wonderful assets and resources, the money, the talent in this state. I think this big sense of the frustration, though, for, for LSU fans is the fact that LSU's most bitter and hated rivals are all in contention for the college football playoff, and LSU isn't. Texas A&M is still alive for the playoff. Ole Miss is making a very strong case for the playoff after a win over Georgia. Alabama still alive in the college football playoff. And LSU is more so on the outside looking in. I think LSU fans just want something tangible to hold on to of we trust that this coach is going to be the guy to be the fourth coach, uh, a consecutive coach at LSU to win a national championship. And I think the feeling is that Brian Kelly isn't that guy, that this program isn't on a trajectory to win a national championship. In year three, you need to see that trajectory. Mm. To your point, Carolina, I've been told by many LSU folks, and you mentioned nine and three is good at some places. Nine and three at LSU gets you fired. That's what yeah. I've been told. So it's, yeah. uh, it's a different kind of job down there in Baton Rouge. You mentioned, though, Carolina, the college football playoff rankings. I want to go there. I, I want to start with this because I've been seeing a lot of this on social media since Tuesday night when the latest rankings came out. Here's the thing. We understand it's not the final rankings. There's no need to, like, lose your cool. That doesn't stop people from losing their cool, especially Georgia fans. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here, I want to go to Georgia first, Carolyn, yeah. and I want to get your take on the whole rankings. But And maybe you think Georgia is where they deserve to be, or maybe you think they're not where they deserve to be. Because when they first came out, I was like, man, Georgia's played a tough schedule, number one strength is schedule. Like, they mentioned that on the broadcast, which I think is really interesting, Carolyn. They kind of dropped these nuggets, like, Two weeks in a row, by the way, we'll get there in a second, but they've kind of taken a jab at Texas a little bit. You know, Tuesday night it was, what's their best win? Vandy, which is valid, and we'll get there in a moment. But at first I was kind of sympathizing with Georgia. Now after I've seen this stuff on social media, Caroline, I'm like, all right, hold on. I was asked, describe one word about Georgia being first team out. I said, deserved. It's where Georgia deserves to be mm -hmm. right now. It's not just, I was in Oxford watching that game in person. You got throttled, and Ole Miss is good. You lost the game at Bam. I was at that game in person, too. Almost a great comeback. They've looked like, excuse my French, shit all <laughs> year. They, they, it's what about Auburn? What about Mississippi State? What about Florida? Like, mm -hmm. Georgia has nobody to blame but Georgia for being first team out. Good news is they control their fate. You beat Tennessee, went out. You are in. You should be in. If these were the final rankings, we'd have some issues. But your thoughts, am I off base, on base with Georgia? I just, I know their schedule's the toughest in college football, but right now I think the, the ranking is fair because mm -hmm. of the way they have looked this season. I think it's both fair and unfair, and I'll explain why. Looking, uh, If you're just looking at the eye test for Georgia, the offense is really struggling. Like Georgia leads the country in dropped passes. Carson Beck is turning the ball over at an alarming rate. Uh, they ran the ball for less than two yards per carry against Ole Miss. They're like the 100th rank rush offense in all of college football. Georgia. Like we're talking about Georgia. RBU cannot run the football, and there's so many reasons for that. Injuries on the offensive line, shakeup on the offensive line. The offense just isn't explosive. So if you watch Georgia week over week over week, you know that this is not the Georgia team that we grew accustomed to seeing in 2021 and 2022 and even last season. The offense lacks explosiveness. The defense is not consistent enough. We see what they're capable of. I mean, that, that defensive unit was insane against Texas. I was like, okay, that's the Georgia defense that we've grown used to. Like, that's the Georgia defense that won back-to-back -back national championships. But we haven't seen that on a consistent basis. So I think you're fair in that, that there are a lot of holes that you can poke in this Georgia roster, and maybe we are all kind of giving them a little bit more benefit of the doubt that they deserve because they're Georgia, and we expect them to be great. I don't know how the committee, though, can justify the drop from three to 13. That's a massive, that's 10 spots 
when you lost to a team that the committee values, an Ole Miss team that's now sitting at 11. And you can say, okay, well, Ole Miss really showed what they were capable of. Ole Miss kind of final score, I don't think, was indicative mm-hmm. of just how dominant Ole Miss was in that win. Okay, well, if Ole Miss is sitting at 11, Georgia's sitting at 12. So you're, you're showing us there's not really that much of a difference between those two teams, but it was indi- it, it deserved Georgia dropping 10 spots. So I don't really know how the college football playoff committee can justify that. And I always use like the hypothetical, if you played on a neutral field today, who would win? And that's, you know, fairy tale football. I know football's played on a field, but sometimes you don't get to see those head-to-head matchups. Today, right now, Penn State, Georgia, what's the Vegas odds? I think Georgia's probably favored by two and a half, three and a half. Well, Penn State's sitting at four. Georgia has just, lost to two really good teams and Georgia has had just a really difficult schedule. Uh, Indiana, Georgia, what's the Vegas <laughs> spread on that? Like I understand the vague that, that, you know, Indiana's probably not getting a lot of the credit that they deserve for how good they've looked because their schedule is so rinky dink, but like, look, I would still take Georgia. And I mean, how, about, how about Georgia BYU, Indiana. Caroline? How about Georgia BYU? <laughs> Georgia's a touchdown. I, I agree with you. I, I think that this year is what we're probably going to learn. I don't know if this will change, but the whole automatic qualifiers thing. I hate. Like, I the hate Big Twelve. The just is not. I mean, and I'm. I'm not going to hide it. Like I have SEC bias. I, I'm at. We're SEC unfiltered. It is yeah. what it is. But like, this is where the best football is. We know that. To your point, I will give you that. That in Miami. Yeah. I mean, the committee ranked them at Frauds, nine. Caroline, but if the Frauds. playoff was tomorrow, <laughs> they'd be the four seed. The ninth best team in the country gets a first round bye in the playoffs. Yeah. Like that's there's something messed up about that. And I like the way that the the playoff committee has found a way to make conference championships games matter. They should matter. If you're going to have them, mm-hmm. they should matter. But there just seems something very off about the ninth best team in the country getting a four seed and Georgia potentially being on the outside looking in because Boise State has to get into the playoff because they're the highest ranked group of five team. I know that the playoff isn't necessarily always fair, but that's just not right. Caroline, you're sounding like Nick Saban a few years ago when he said that the Ve- – what was it, what was the thing he said that if we were – you put this game in Vegas, we'd be fa- – he got a lot of heat for talking about Vegas odds. He's like, well, we'll just go off what Vegas number- – I don't disagree with you, though. I, yeah. I agree with you 100%. I mean, yeah. if it's about – you know, if it's about the 12 best teams in the country, well, Georgia's roster can win a national title. Mm-hmm. BYU's roster, all due respect to them. Indiana – I've been kind of poo-pooing on Indiana lately on, on our show. All due respect to them, Georgia would skull drag you. I, there's just no other yeah. way to put it. Um, switching gears a little bit, Carolina, I ask you this because, you know, we've got the potential of South Carolina is playing some of the best football in the country right now. Texas A&M is a really good team. I mean, LSU might be in this boat. I'll ask you, do you think that a 9-3 and SEC team – is there a path for a 9-3 and three SEC team to get in? I think it was Heather Dinich on ESPN uh-huh. had kind of mentioned that. What if Georgia goes 9-3, and three, number one strength of schedule? To your point, 9-3 and three SEC team, do you see it happening or do you think that's a no-go in year one of the 12-team playoff? That's a no-go for me. A 10-3 and three SEC team can get in because that would be an SEC team that went 9-3 and three in the regular season and then won the SEC championship game. I just think the field is way too crowded for a three loss team to get in because right now it's looking like there's going to be four big 10 teams. Now, if Indiana loses to Ohio state, I think that there's a fair argument to be made that an 11 and one Indiana team is undeserving of the college football playoff, but that's going to play itself out. Mm -hmm. I, but I look at, you know, how the big 12 shakes out. Like if BYU wins out and then loses to Colorado in the big 12 title game, I think there's probably a fair argument to be made that both of those teams get in with BYU having wins over SMU and Kansas State, two top 25 teams. And then obviously, if Colorado wins the conference championship game, they would get the first round by, assuming they're higher ranked than Boise State. So it's just looking like the field. And then Notre Dame. You throw Notre Dame into all of this. If Notre Dame beats Army, well, that's a spot that I think it's going to be taken. So I think that the, the playoff field is just too crowded for a nine and three SEC team that didn't even get to the conference championship game to get in. If there is any team that would be most likely to get in, I would have to say it's 
probably either Alabama or Georgia because Alabama has those wins over LSU and, and Georgia to kind of bolster up the resume. A 9-3 and three Georgia team, I guess you could make an argument for it, but they're already on the outside looking in with two losses. And then another loss to Tennessee, I I I, I don't see mm-hmm. it. I really, I don't see it. 10-3, and three, though, with a conference championship win, obviously, you would find yourself in the playoff. Caroline, I want to jump to Texas quickly because, as I mentioned, I found it interesting the last two weeks. I think week one of the rankings dropping, I think maybe it was Joey Galloway through sort of a jab. And then last night or Tuesday night, it was Reese Davis that just kind of, you know, they've been questioning, you know, the schedule. And again, Tuesday night, it was Reese saying, who, who is Texas beating? What's their best win? I mean, Fair. Vandy, Colorado State. I, I mean, when you look at Texas, I'll ask you this looking down the road, Texas, Texas A&M and College Station, do you view that game as a college football playoff eliminator for the loser of the game? It depends on who loses it. <laughs> if Texas A&M loses that game, then yes. For then sure. Texas for sure. A&M is completely out yeah. of the playoff. If Texas loses that game, I think that there is a very fair argument for Texas to be left out of the playoff. And we're talking about strength of schedule and, you know, if you don't play anyone on your schedule, well, Texas hasn't really played anyone on their schedule either. And the best team that they played on their schedule, they lost. Mm -hmm. So, and, and someone asked me the other day, who do you think is the best team in the SEC? And I said, Texas, I guess. Like, I was asked that today too. It said the same thing. I, like, I said I don't, the same thing. I don't feel great about <laughs> it, but I, I guess I give them the benefit of the doubt. So I think it would be a really bad look for Texas. The two best teams that they played on their schedule, assuming that Texas does lose to Texas A&M, best two teams on their schedule, you lost, and then you mm-hmm. beat up on kind of the bottom feeders of the SEC, and you went on the road and beat Michigan in the big house. Michigan is terrible. So it, there's not really anything that's bolstering Texas's resume up right now. It's the fact that they only have one loss and that loss has come against a team that the committee values in Georgia. So if Tex, I would say, yes, the loser of that game, Texas, Texas A&M is out of the college football playoff. Caroline, it feels looking at the bracket right now and where these SEC teams sit, who's in, who's out. It feels like to me, and I want to get your take on this, the team that is most likely to get screwed in all this is Tennessee. I, I think if 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 everything plays out as chalk, mm-hmm. you know, Texas, let's say, beats AM, they're in. Alabama wins out the rest of the way, which they should. Uh, Georgia beats Tennessee, went out the rest of the way. I think they'd be in. Ole Miss wins out. I think they'd be in kind of feels like Tennessee unless Notre Dame loses in an open act because I, I think if Notre Dame loses it definitely feels like it opens up that spot or if we have some other chaos like to get a fifth SEC team in but if we have four Caroline I feel like the Vols might get get kind of kind of get get one pulled over them a little bit and uh, I know Tennessee folks hate to hear that but I don't know what what say you they they control their destiny they can beat yeah. Georgia this week and put all this to bed but I don't know, even with the win over Bama, which is so crazy, and this would be assuming they beat Vandy, too, who Bama Mm -hmm. lost to, but I don't know. It feels like, to me, it's kind of lining up Tennessee might be the odd one out. Isn't that so Tennessee? Like, oh, their their fans are already (laughs) – they're already, like, preparing. They're like, we're going to get screwed. We know we are – I've seen it all over Twitter. Like we're we're gonna get left out, aren't we? And that is so just pinnacle of battered vol syndrome. And it is so unfortunate, but I think that you're right. And that's something that I talked about yesterday on my my show, the College Football Power Hour on Yahoo Sports. Can a ten and two Tennessee team get into the playoff? A lot would have to happen around Tennessee. Notre Dame would probably have to lose to Army. Indiana would have to lose convincingly to Ohio State. And the committee would have to drop Indiana out of the top 12. So they would no longer control their own destiny. There's a path for a 10-2 and Tennessee team. But that loss against Arkansas weighs heavy Mm. on the resume. If there's anything that I've taken from the first two iterations of the college football playoff rankings is if you have a good loss, the committee will give you the benefit of the doubt. Ohio State with a good loss to Oregon. Penn State with a quality loss to Ohio State. And I will just say I despise the term quality loss. It's like the stupidest oxymoron that we use in playoff rankings. But the committee has also shown if you have a quote-unquote non-quality loss, they'll ding you for it. And that's exactly what we're seeing with Tennessee. 
If they lose to Georgia, they will have one quality win over Alabama. But where else has the quality win come from? They beat a 24th ranked NC State team at the time, but NC State now, as we have learned, is terrible. They ranked it, or they they beat a top 15 Oklahoma team at the beginning of the year. Oklahoma is terrible. Uh, they lost to Arkansas. They went to overtime against Florida. They played close against Kentucky for about three quarters. They didn't look great against Mississippi State, although the final score would indicate that they crushed them, which they did. So if they lose to Georgia, is the win over Alabama enough to carry them to the playoff? I would argue yes, because a win over Alabama would be better than anything that Indiana has done so far. I could make the argument that a win over Alabama is better than what Texas has on their resume right now. I think a 10-2 and two Tennessee team is deserving, but if the college football playoff committee wants to leave Tennessee out with two losses, I can see a justification for that. And to your point, too, about, again, that was a game that I was at as well in Fayetteville when Tennessee got beat by Arkansas. Doesn't help, by the way, that, uh, you know, Arkansas the last few weeks and upcoming has been facing some teams that, you know, I think style points matter a little bit. So yeah. old Miss drops 60 on their head. Texas might do the same. That loss can get worse if yeah. they keep getting beat down uh, as the season goes. Caron Fenton, Yahoo Sports, Series XM. Caron, I appreciate you taking the time. Last thing before I get you out of here. When okay. you look at the current playoff structure, or just who's in right now, how many of these teams in the top 12 do you look at realistically and say that team can win a national championship? That team can win the whole thing. It's a good question because I think in the past we've always said national championship contender. Every team in the playoff is a national championship contender because there's only four teams. Mm -hmm. This year, there's a stark difference between playoff contender and national championship contender Boise State Colorado they're <laughs> playoff contenders absolutely not national championship contenders so I'll just go through the top 12 Oregon 100% national title contender Ohio State 100% national title contender Texas is a team that I trust to beat anyone in America. I also trust Texas to lose to anyone in America. Penn State, I don't see it. I don't think there's enough explosiveness on that offense. Indiana, beat Ohio State, and I'll change my mind. But right now, no. BYU, I think they're a good team and a really good story. I don't think they're good enough to sustain you know, the entirety of, of the college football playoff to win a national championship. Tennessee, if Nico Iamaleava can stay healthy, it would questionable to play this week against Georgia. If Dylan Sampson stays healthy, I think Tennessee can beat anyone in the country. I think Tennessee is a national title contender. Notre Dame? Yes. Miami? No. They've been playing way too close to the fire, and they finally got burned against Georgia Tech. They remind me a lot of 2023 LSU. You've got a Superman quarterback that can erase a lot of, of wrongdoings, but you got a defense that just can't always overcome. Alabama, yes. Ole Miss, yes. Georgia, yes. Boise State, SMU, we're getting into territory that I just don't think they have enough talent. So I would say about half of the field right now is a true national title contender. Yeah, I'd go six to seven as well. I think it's a good number. Uh, again, Carolina Fenton, Sirius XM, Yahoo Sports. Carolina, I appreciate you taking the time. Let folks know where they can check out all of your great work and just everything you've got going on. Yeah, absolutely. You can follow me on Twitter at Caroline Fenton one at Caroline Fenton mistaken, unfortunately. Um, you can find me on SEC this morning and the SEC whip around on Sirius XM, SEC radio and college sports radio. And you can find me at Yahoo Sports. I have a show twice a week called the College Football Power Hours. So you can find that on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Caroline, great stuff. Appreciate you taking the time. Let's definitely do it again soon. Absolutely. Appreciate you.